The following video is a frank interview with a soldier who has recently returned from the front in Ukraine. It contains references to recent deaths and about a dozen words of strong soldierly language. We are joined today by Joseph MacDonald. Some of you might have uh, seen an earlier video of mine in which I interviewed him when he'd made the decision to go and fight in Ukraine uh, against the Russian invasion. And uh, now he's back. Uh, so you went out to Ukraine having been interviewed by me in the airport, uh, and then you arrived, what did you find? Well, hello Lloyd, good to see you again. Um, yeah, basically from the last moment we spoke, um, we, I, I got on the plane, mm -hmm. we went to Warsaw, yep. I met one or two people on the plane who were d doing the same thing. Right. And when we got to Warsaw uh, Airport from the other flights that had come in, it was um, apparent that there were more people. Mm -hmm. And we sort of formed this little group. And then some people approached us, and everyone's a bit nervous. So, well, it could be Russian spies, well, you could know? Be. And then, the, you know, we decided that they weren't Russian spies, you know, in the right. airport and everything. Because they were so nice. Yeah, they were very nice. And right. They gave us cigarettes and stuff. Okay. Um, and then we got on a, a minibus, which took us to the Polish border. Right. And that was a bit of a shock because, uh, you know, it was spring in England when I left. You know, if, I'm not sure if you remember the exact date, but, you know, the, right. the little purple flowers in the park were out and the birds were singing and we got mm -hmm. to the Polish border and there was a foot of snow ah. and it was absolutely freezing. And then we spent about 24 hours at the Polish border and more people turned up. And now there was right. quite, quite a lot of chaps and there was some media there and... Um, and uh, you know, people, people being interviewed again about mm -hmm. what they were going to do, and uh, and we we all got loaded onto coaches, several coaches, right. and then bussed uh, over the border into Ukraine, mm -hmm. and taken to this large large base uh, near the near the Polish border, and um, and then you know every, it was you're making friends, you're finding out who's who or who says what they are, you know. Oh. Right. An awful lot of um, battle, battle forces, as we like to call them, <laughs> okay. and um, an awful lot of people like that, but a lot of good guys as well, and mm. we're all at this base, and everyone's sort of rearing to go, you know, mm -hmm. because we've, we've got no real context of what's actually happening inside Ukraine at the time, and, you know, Kiev was looked like it might fall at the time and stuff like that. It was right. the very early days of the war, and then it just fell into this very normal, slow boring process that pretty much any any army would do if it suddenly had a couple of thousand raw recruits on its hand you mm -hmm. know and we're being we're lining up for chow we're being formed into little squads we're being um you know given some very basic induction lessons like this is an ak-47 mm -hmm. here's how it works we're not going to give you one yet but now you know how it works when we do uh, here's a demonstration on um, Russian armoured vehicles and helicopters and stuff. And, you know, it, it all suddenly felt like everything had really slowed down, you know. Right. And there wasn't... The, it didn't feel like we were at war. It felt like we turned up for like, some very normal kind of military induction stuff, which is very slow-paced and mm -hmm. boring and clunky. And uh, we sort of fell into this, you know, we're just getting issued our kit and going through the, you know, having an interview with the battalion commander and all that sort of stuff that mm -hmm. a new recruit might do. And then on the third night we were there, which was uh, the morning of March 13th. Um, right. Well, there have been quite a few, there'd been air raids already, you see. There'd been air raid warnings. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden... You, you're just detailed to just run out of your tent or your building and head in the direction of the woods and the, and the field where the helicopter pad is and just try and take take some cover. And it's very cold. So you know? no bunkers, no cellars, no trenches, just some the woods. Trenches, some trenches, but they're mostly full of fucking water. Um, oh. So, you know, there wasn't really... You know, we're, we're at 20k from the Polish border, mm -hmm. so I don't think they'd really... This isn't an area of Ukraine where everyone's immediately seeing the urge to dig in and right. stuff. We probably should have, it turns out. I mean, there were, there were some trenches in the middle of the parade. There's like a, a bit of grass up from the parade ground, and they dug some trenches there, and it's really good none of us use those trenches, as, as you'll find out in a minute. Oh, right. So... 
Um, there'd already been some air raids and we've all gone running out into the cold and it was it was like minus 15, minus 20. It was serious. Oh, proper cold. E proper cold, like Eastern European winter warfare cold, you know. Mm -hmm. And we've all been out in the cold and, you know, sometimes you get fully dressed and you go out and it's still cold. Mm -hmm. Then other times you sort of don't quite and it's it's even colder. But So we're, we're getting a bit fed up of this, you know. We've already started to feel that these air raids, for which we've, we've heard no bangs, we've seen no jet, heard or seen no jets roaring mm -hmm. overhead. We're getting the feeling that these are like keep the lads busy military drills, oh. you know, like a fire drill, right. you know. So which is important but at the same time annoying mm. no one likes getting out of bed and running around in the cold at two three in the morning se several times a night you know mm. and then suddenly it happened you know there'd been an air raid warning and we all went out and someone s shouted all clear and a few other people shouted all clear and we all just filed back into the barracks and went back to bed and what we didn't know was that was a false all clear and this time it was for real and we went back to bed and at that time, uh, I've heard 36 or 42 uh, caliber Russian cruise missiles were flying towards us. And um, we woke up to right. one of them hitting uh, one, of the, one of the buildings on the base about 150 meters for us, from us. And uh, a caliber missile's got a 500 kilogram warhead. So, um, yeah, it's over a thousand pounds. Yeah, so most, um, most explode, you know, if you see a mortar or an artillery uh, shell go off, it's really very undramatic. There's like a bang and a puff of smoke, a bit of dust, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, not even a puff of smoke, just some dust, really. And there's no, if it's any sort of daytime, there's no visible flames. It's not like a film explosion at all. Right. Caliber missiles are like a film explosion. If you get enough explosives, you get a huge fireball and the whole sky turns like a African sunrise all of a sudden. And um, yeah, basically the whole base was, apart from the apartment block where most of the recruits were, mm -hmm. this whole very large military base was just destroyed around us. And... Uh, they were shooting them out the scudder. The air defence had obviously fired some SAM missiles and some of the caliber missiles were blowing up in the sky mm -hmm. above us. Um, you know, we heard the first one go off and, and it's like, you know, we'd already had these drills. So I heard the boom, which... I, I, can you imagine what Godzilla or King Kong kicking a metal wheelie bin full of gunpowder down a brick alleyway and then it going off? I have like. often imagined that very sound. It's based, that's what it sounds like. You know, there's a great mm. almighty crash and then a terrifying boom and then more crashes and stuff like that. And um, So back out of bed, I imagine. Well, back, straight back out of bed, this time into boots, jacket on. Fuck the trousers. There's no time for putting on trousers. Yeah. And my mate Pops, uh, Australian guy who came over with me, uh, he's like, Big Mac, is it real? I'm like, it's fucking real, move. <laughs> and we're all piling, piling down this corridor. Yeah. And we got out. And as about 10 seconds after I got out, or less, a few seconds after I got out the door with Pops just behind me, you know, 10 metres or so behind me, mm. there's a... <laughs> and the bang! And the the headquarters building that was next to the chow hall got hit and was just ab obliterated. That that killed some people. It killed some senior Ukrainian right. officers and some civilian staff, sadly. And I, as I heard that, <laughs> took a dive in the air because I knew whatever was going to hit was close. Mm -hmm. And I remember being pushed through the like the, the blast catching my feet and pushing me through the air more. Mm -hmm. And... Um, <laughs> Um, when I landed, I had some pain there, and uh, turns out I thought it was just a really bad graze at the time. But turns out I'd picked up some bits of small bits of secondary shrapnel in my knee, little bits of glass and concrete, and tiny bits of wire that just got right. picked up by the the size of that explosion. Yeah. And my friend Pops went past me about six foot in the air and landed on his back uh, and really really hurt his back. But I didn't actually see him at the time. Right. I didn't I didn't see him fly past me. I was told this later by him. He was like, yeah, you were on the ground. And I was like fly, flying through the air thinking, oh, I'm fucked, aren't I? Um, and he, he really twisted his back. Uh, we took a lot of injuries in yeah. that incident um, came from people hurting themselves in the panic to escape. Right. Broke, broken ankles, broken wrists, crush, minor crush injuries, um, etc. How many people are you talking about? Hundreds? Uh, maybe like 
maybe 50, 60 people got like badly injured in the in the in the kind of escape from all. Sorry, the I mean, uh, total number of people. Then. At that time, at our bit of the base, mm. and there was other things going on. Mm. Um, there were maybe like like a thousand uh, oh, legionnaire okay. recruits at that point. And um, yeah, like maybe 50 or 60, they managed to sustain some kind of, you know, you're not going to be playing football or maybe you need a few weeks off work in civilian life kind of injuries, you right. know, broken wrist, branch in the fucking eye, running in the forest. That was a, quite a nasty one. I think, I think that guy was Spanish and I think he lost the eye. Um, yeah, there was quite a lot of stuff like that. Like we, were, we were all very lucky. How the, the missiles that were intended for our uh, barracks mm. must have got shot down. Right. But if they'd hit, we'd, we'd all be dead. They would have wiped out the Legion on like day, day three of most of us being there. So know. presumably the Russians had very good intelligence as to where you were. Well, it was said afterwards that they'd been able to pick up the vast number of foreign SIM cards, etc., etc., et at this base. And there were also, there was also things at this base, like it's one of Ukraine's most sophisticated bases. Mm -hmm. It has uh, virtual reality training facilities and stuff, stuff like that, and, and yeah. quite a lot of military equipment stored there. So it was, with us, it just made it even more of a viable target. And another way to look at it is even if they were just after the foreign le legionaries and they picked us up because of our f mobile phones. Mm -hmm. If you're going to hide a bunch of chaps who are foreign, who've come to fight for your country, don't put them at the International Cooperation Centre. That's all uh, I've got to say. That was a clue. Yes. Of, if you were playing pin the missile on the donkey... Right. ...and I was Vladimir Putin, you know, that it'd be a good, a good bet right next to the Polish border, called the International Cooperation Centre. Large base, definitely capable of dealing with all of these people coming in. Let's blow that one up, eh? But they, they bet heavily, because that, that's a lot of very expensive missiles. Yes, it? it is. Yeah, we worked out that afterwards it's something like 60 or 70,000 uh, euros a man he spent trying to kill us, which is quite nice. No one's ever spent that much on me before. Oh. Well, well thank you, Vlad. You know, shame he missed, but uh, still here. But, right. uh, you know, try again, if you like. Um, OK, so roughly a 1,000 people have very nearly died. Yes. And, and uh, they, 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 they poor... I think there was a building on the base with the, the... I think the Ukrainian officer recruits took, like, quite a lot of casualties. I don't have official numbers. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to try and pretend. But over 100, you know. We were very lucky. There was, like, a few... A few killed on our base. Mm -hmm. And a few wounded. Like, some poor Italian guy got chopped up um got chopped up by glass right. when the windows blew in and a, a friend of mine a polish friend of mine actually had a piece of his uh, leg bone removed from his leg a few weeks uh, a, a few weeks later basically so he got managed uh. to pick up some what's called wet shrapnel which is bits of person uh, okay, during it. so you know it was a it was <clears throat> a very real uh, thing. There's a, a video that some legionnaire, who mm -hmm. I definitely don't know, mm -hmm. uh, took that made its way onto the Telegraph, and I think we'll be able to show that to give people an idea right. of what the ha what it's like hiding in the woods at night while 500 kilogram bombs and missiles drop all around you. So yeah, that was that was day three right. of, of my experience in Ukraine, and um, the next morning there was an incident that I. Well, hang on, before the next morning, so uh, well, eventually the the the, the bangs stopped. Yeah, the bangs and stopped. And people have got to pick themselves off the. And it started ground. to get light, you yeah. know, and then we're all running around trying to find our mates. Uh, I, w I had a ghillie stow. I went back and got some of my stuff straight away, but not all of it. Mm -hmm. um, our, our building wasn't really that damaged at the time, apart from blown in windows. Right. It managed to catch fire a bit later on. I'm not sure how. Hmm. 
don't know how. There were all the burning things around, so it's entirely possible I missed something. Right. I went back and got my bag, got my ghillie stove out. Uh, if anyone doesn't know what a ghillie stove is, you should look them up. They're wonderful. Mm -hmm. And uh, I basically started making tea for people because some guys, you know, once the first bomb had gone off, some, some people had completely abandoned all this getting dressed bollocks, you know, just mm -hmm. <laughs> flip flops, boxers, t shirt out into the minus 20 winter. Right. And some people had, had like fallen into ditches with an inch or two of ice on. So they'd gone through and oh. were very, very cold. Yeah. So, you know, I started just trying to, like, you know, anyone I knew or I'd spoken to, if you or even people I don't, if they were looking cold, try and get guys to sit by them, mm -hmm. keep on either side, try and get the guys who look like they're most at risk of hypothermia a cup of tea. And, um, right, just so, the, so the immediate risk then was just cold? Hypothermia, yeah. I mean, it's Eastern European winters, no, it's no joke, you know. So that was the immediate risk. Right. Some of our guys had gone off to deal with wounded people on other parts of the base. I went off and helped with that for five minutes mm -hmm. and then found that, the, you know, at that moment in time, I, there were much more qualified medics and stuff around and I was just getting in the way. Right. So I did my best to retrieve some of the platoon stuff. By that point, sadly, there was an awful lot of looting going on, like a lot of looting. Mm. Um, it appears... A lot of people who came to volunteer for the Ukrainians were also kleptomaniacs or just total gits mm. who'd gone there with the intention of plunder, you know. Um, and yeah, uh, we, that, that was a problem that the Legion kept having for several months. People who turned up to go on the rob. And, right. uh, I don't think that's a reflection on Ukraine or the Legion at the whole, as a whole because mm -hmm. those people got pushed out. But it was... a uh, a no vetting sign up will take anyone free for all at the start. Right. And it drew in a lot of undesirable types. That's all there is to say about it. But mm. uh, but they got pushed out. You know, it turns out cr criminals and, and gangsters and thieves, they don't have much courage when it gets right down to it. So they didn't stick around for very long, you know. Right. But uh, the next morning, after we'd sort of been, well, now we're in the woods, you know, it's like you're not going back to the barracks. Mm. We've got to go and set up. Uh, camp in the woods and there was also this intel going around that the uh, they'd landed paratroopers near us mm. and this turned out to be false but at the time we had no concept that we had no real way to tell you know it said okay we're right next to the Polish border paratroopers seems unlikely on the other hand mm. You know, the Russians seemed to be just thoroughly winning at the time. They were advancing in every area and maybe dropping some paratroopers in to wipe out a thousand unarmed, untrained international recruits mm. would be a really good sort of med media victory. And uh, I can see how, yes, a, a crushing blow to uh, international recruits might just cut off the yeah, supply of international yeah, well, they, recruits they, for the rest they of the They wiped out the first thousand in a few days. I'm not signing up for that. You mm. know, they were at a big base and everything. So, yeah, um, but oh, it turned out to not be true, but there was, um, that night, we were in the woods, and we'd been told again about the paratroopers. It wasn't just one person mentioned this, you know, mm -hmm. a Ukrainian officer had come up and told us, like, we've been told that there are troops in the area, and they're trying to advance towards this, this position. Right. And we had three FNCs, which is a bit like a FAL, right. from 556, you know, sure. an SLR FAL. It's, like a, right. a, it's a rifle, par yeah. Paratroopers FAL. We had three of them. And a bunch of scorpions that had basically been sort of looted themselves during the thing. The the Georgian Legion who were there with us, mm -hmm. um, yeah, not a not the most um, uniform and regi regimented group of guys. I'd say quite right. quite piratey. Uh, they decided in the midst of the attack that mm -hmm. they didn't like being unarmed and ripped a, a shipping container that was basically an armory open. Mm -hmm. And me. <laughs> Me and, me and my NCO, Chris, uh, sort of were there in the group of people. We're going, hey, hey, hey you, you chaps, you, should you be doing that? Should, stop, stop doing that. We're, we're all going to get in trouble. And they turned round and sort of hissed at and growled at us like a pack of hyenas on a carcass. And it was just like, you know, yeah, you know what? Mm. All right, I'm sure they've got the reasons. You know, <laughs> yes. this is this is not a bit of the world, really. They have their own cultural ways. Let's let them let them get on with it. Right. And then they just sort of came over and gave us an armful of the shit guns they didn't like. And it was like, well, you know, you know what? Actually, yeah. Given given the circumstances, I'll, I'll wait until a Ukrainian officer tells me to give him that back. I'm going to use it to 
potentially defend myself. Okay, so a so, thousand men have got three rifles and well, half well, a dozen. Well, I'd say my section, not a thousand men, my section, right. which was about about 30 guys, my sort of platoon that we've fallen into, right. of about 30 guys, had three rifles and a couple of scorpions chambered in 32 ACP, which is a... I fired one at a tree because mm. I wanted to see if it worked. You know, it's like, I'm going to have an ND boss. He's like, yeah, all right, just, just the one, though. You know, let's see if these things work. And it went into this uh, hardwood tree about, about yay much. Right. So I'm pretty certain that unless you hit someone sort of right in the, in the right sort of spot, you, you're not going to stop a human being with that. It'd be like poking, uh, poking a man with a knitting needle that's only that long. It'll, it'll thoroughly right. annoy him. Right. But it won't stop him. So we had these sort of redundant guns and some three very old rifles and waited in the woods for the paratroopers to kill, come and kill us all night. Um, but they didn't, which was nice. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was sort of the the second night after the explosion. And we sort of, they tried to get us to do some like training and stuff on, on the field, uh, you know, like bit of fire and movement and basic patrolling and stuff but it sort of was becoming apparent that this this base was just out of action now and us all staying there was just asking for it mm -hmm. so the decision came to move us to uh, a base uh, in central ukraine um near the city of rivna right and um you know we we basically yeah after uh them keeping us in the woods and being like light discipline uh, you know, no, no smoke, you know, I mean, I've had a little ghillie stove going that some people had made fires and just put damp wood on. So they just, you know, made massive smoke signals and, and stuff and, uh, no smoke, no, no white, no torches, no, not even red light at night. You know, we were worried about drones or fighter planes, etc., mm -hmm. spotting us and deciding to target another attack. And um, then they decided to move us in this, like, four bus. Just as it went dark, you know, to give any aerial enemy mm. maximum chance of spotting the lights on your vehicle. Because it's, a, you know, it's a wartime. After, after like, 8 o'clock at night, there's hardly anyone on the road. You know? Right. It was, I think it was, a, yeah, it was an 8 o'clock curfew in those days. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, just as it got to dark, they're like, right. I'm going to go in a big convoy of buses with police cars escorting us with the blue blue lights strobing and we're all like, we're... Oh, they're famously difficult to see from the we're air. We're all going to die, aren't we? We're all, we're unarmed. We have two saloons of Ukrainian officers with, like, AKs guarding us. 300 guys on the bus because... Oh, yeah, I think I might have missed a bit there, but there was a, there was a thing called the Great Desertion in this time. Well, right. I call it the Great Desertion, mm -hmm. where... About six, seven hundred people either went home or went off to join some other unit or some other militia in Ukraine that they thought would be better, that they thought would give them all their equipment straight away and allow them to shoot lots of Russians without ever getting shelled, which seems to be a, a fantasy that sadly a lot of people have entertained when they volunteered in Ukraine. That, right. there's a, that there's a sweet spot of the war where you can just go pew, pew, pew and shoot the Russians and you won't be getting horribly shelled and mortared and fired at by tanks and cluster bombs and stuff while you're going pew, pew, pew. Mm. There's, um, anyone wanting to volunteer, there's no sweet spot like that. If you're yeah. fighting the Russians, you're getting horribly shelled. Okay? No one gets... No one gets... Uh, no one gets the call of duty experience, you know. The mm. artillery strike is on all the time. So all these people left. Right, so you're down to 300. Down to they 300, get on, get on coaches. We go to bus, we go to a base in central Ukraine. And they told us we'd be staying at tents in a forest. And they'd put about like, eight or ten tents, big, big scout, you know, army oh, yeah. scout camp type tents, you mm. know, with a wood burner in and stuff. They put these in a block in the middle of a field right next to each other regimentally straight one one bomb would have just <laughs> killed everyone so we um and immediately as we arrived there mm -hmm. you know because we, we haven't been told anything we were, we're taking you to a base okay right. we get out of the bus in the dark in some field they take us through this field it's all ditches and stuff like that you know not terrain that encourages you to go wandering around exploring mm -hmm. you know into these tents and then suddenly a, a truck, a military truck just pulls up out of everywhere and our commander's like, shit, go and 
hide, hide. We don't know who these are. Right. These could be Russians. These could be separatists. Could be Spetsnaz. And it turned out it was some local Ukrainians delivering wood for us to burn. But, you know, mm -hmm. it was everything was very chaotic in the early days, you know. I mean, bless the Ukrainians. They were doing their best, but, like, they, they'd never dealt with this situation any before. And just finding enough people to sort of... Mm. run this and organise this whole new thing whilst you're being invaded by the Russians is quite difficult. T yeah. Tell us a bit about the people. So when you were at the, at the airport, you say you met some guys. Mm -hmm. Presumably you recognised them because of what they were carrying. They had the military... No, no, there were, stuff. Pops was in civvies, uh, total civvies. He didn't have a stitch of uh, military gear on him. It's funny, when we got to the uh, Polish border, he goes, oh, it's a bit cold. I was like, yeah, are you, you're going to be OK, mate. Have you got, like, long johns and thermals? And he's like... Long Johns, what do you think I am? A poof, you know? Um, it gets cold in Australia, mate. And I just was like, <laughs> <laughs> it gets cold in Australia? We're on the Eastern Front, mate. You're going <laughs> to fucking die. All right, come and speak to me in a few hours and see how you feel. Mm. And uh, by the time we got to the, 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 the um, hotel on the border, he was all wearing my merino wool long johns and a merino wool top and a hood. I brought two like green military hoodies with me and he's like, you've already saved my life, mate. <laughs> you know? And he meant it, you know. Um, so Pops was, uh, Pops was probably my first good friend as well. There was another Australian who crossed with us called um, Taz and mm. sadly passed away now. Taz was our second casualty. Um, me, us, we were like a trio, you mm. know, we, we were really tight in the early days. And, but, you know, there was people from, apart from Africa, mm -hmm. I don't think we've had anyone from Morocco or Egypt or anything like that. Mm. Or we, South Africans weren't allowed to join uh, uh, initially. Right. Because they said that um, uh, the, uh, their government said they supported Russia, so they were out. Uh, but later on, we did get a South African or two mm -hmm. um, who'd already come through the Foreign Legion, you know, through the through the French Foreign Legion, mm -hmm. and then decided to to leave the lawfully or unlawfully and join the Ukrainian Foreign Legion. Um, so yeah, we had we had didn't have any uh, Africans, but everyone else, like we have, ev obviously everyone from every ex uh, USSR country, because mm -hmm. they all hate the Russians, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, Everyone from Europe, uh, lots of French, damn good soldiers, don't care what anyone says. Lots of Spanish, also mm -hmm. damn good soldiers, you know, they're not lacking in work ethic or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, plenty of Scandies, you know, the Finns obviously like fighting the Russians is just in their, in their blood, that's mm -hmm. what they do. Um, uh, and Col the Americas, presumably. Uh, oh, well, yeah, you know, Canadians, lots of Canadians, some really great guys from the First Nations of Canada and from the, the French side. Sadly, the rest of them proved a bit on the uh, cowardly side. It's the only way to say it. I don't care if you've uh, been in the army for 10 years. If you can't handle a bit of a mortaring, you know, like all the other Ukrainians in our mm -hmm. area are, are taking every day, you know, and you, and you come and you turn back because the war isn't, you know... So you're saying these are men who'd been in the army for yeah. perhaps as long as 10 years, yeah. though hadn't been deployed in action, uh -huh. and, as, and as, soon soon as, as soon as they actually saw action... Yeah, as soon as they got... like what We're talking about, you know, a, a mo not consistent shelling. This isn't the Somme. Mm -hmm. We're talking about medium shelling, mostly from mortars, some grabs with cluster bombs, some one two twos, mostly mortars, and uh, they turned tail and, and went home because I, I, I ended up writing a little poem one day called Goldilocks Soldiers. And I'm sure you can get the basic concept that the, this mm. soldier, the, this soldier was a high speed low drag operator who had three tours of Iraq and four of Afghanistan, but he didn't like it when the enemy had bit bigger guns than him, so he went home. Mm. And this soldier had 14 years experience in the army as a sergeant, but it turned out he didn't want he he only wanted to shoot Russians, and he didn't want to accept that part of being a soldier is digging a hole and getting shelled. So he went home as well. And there was a lot of sadly okay, a, a so, lot of guys like that. So there are a lot of people who've, who've been trained. Yeah. Uh, but when it actually came to action, they they uh, decided that this wasn't the war they wanted to fight. Yeah, it was. It's it's you know it's great being. 
Like, I've got a lot of respect for the uh, a lot of the Americans I met. Like the guys from the U.S. We, guys who have got no military background, mm. guys who came from the U.S. Marine Corps, the Tenth Mountain United States Rangers, solid, really solid. Mm. Uh, a lot of the guys who came with no military background were some of the most solid because they just accepted reality as it was. Mm. They weren't used to having things better or more organised or done differently. And um, they, uh, and I think, you know, the, the, those three reg American regiments I mentioned, or mm. corps, whatever you want to say, the, they have a, a history of being some of the more underfunded and um, hard done by bits of the American military. So therefore, it, right. it fosters a more British attitude towards soldiering, which is make do and mend, get on with what you have, and you fight the war, you, you fight the for war with the weapons you have, not the weapons you want, mm. you know? And um, they were some really sorry, but a lot of the Americans, the only way to describe them is, is spoiled, really. Oh you know, it's very easy to be the best army in the world when you can get an F-16 to go and blow up a mortar team on a hillside, mm -hmm. you know? But, yeah, I heard one of them going, we need air support! And it's just like cricket suddenly, like, you know, air support? I haven't seen a fighter play in this whole bloody war. <coughs> They're all over Kiev. Keeping the president safe, you know, like that. Mm. We don't get her support, mate. You know, we're, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a myth. You know, mm. it doesn't exist. And frankly, getting artillery support, it might take a few hours. You know, we can't just get on the blower and have whatever's in front of us flattened. Not, at, not at that point, anyway. You know. What about getting you to a field hospital if you're injured? Depends where you are. Mm. Uh, Kazavak was done by initial, initially on foot. You mm. know. Um, and, or, or carrying people out on a stretcher, getting them into a car, will be a civilian car. Mm -hmm. If we're lucky, it's a 4x4. Four four. If we're lucky, the 4x4 four four can get close to where you've been wounded mm -hmm. because of the, the roads and mud conditions and whether, that, uh, whether driving vehicles in is just going to incite way more shelling, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, so Kazavak, like, a lot of... The, that was another reason a lot of guys, they suddenly refused to... They didn't want to go to the front because they could, They were expecting half an hour Kazavak. And it's like, who do you think gets half an hour Kazavak in this country? Zelensky. Mm -hmm. That's who. No one else, mate. Like, you know, if you're really lucky, if everything's like, oh, he's been hit. OK, yeah, he's in cover, though, so that's great. And it's like, oh, quick tourniquet on, into the car. Oh, the ambulance is right over there. OK, if that... You know, it's potentially you get Kazavak quickly, but probably not. Mm -hmm. You're probably looking at an hour or two. Mm -hmm. And, you know... And uh, that's just how it was, you know, it, like people came because they wanted to fight the Russians and they did. They seem to have missed out this bit where you, you forget that you're fighting for a, a much smaller country mm. that's just been invaded by Russia. So however, you know, Ukraine, automatically you're going to assume, rightly so, that it's a bit, bit less organised, a bit less developed than like, say, France or England or America, right? Mm. But imagine how disorganised England would be if we'd just been invaded by the Russians. Like, you know, well, very, it <laughs> you know, like... Is it at tea time on the weekend? Yes. Oh, oh terribly, goodness. terribly that, disorganised, you right. know. So that everyone, I think a lot of people were expecting to come and just be given, like, you know, they'd, they'd step in there and it'd just be like a call of duty mm -hmm. loadout screen, you know. All of a sudden they'd be like, OK, I've got the helmet I want and night vision and the rifle I want and do, 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 go pew 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 and mm. kill those Russians and it's like that's not what war is actually like people see little videos of the money shot we call it you know they'll see a video of some people doing urban stuff and they're like kicking in a door bang 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 and, mm. and it's it's all very dramatic right they don't show the whole rest of that day where they've just been in a ditch getting shelled or while they're doing the pew 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 mm -hmm. that a tank locates them and starts firing high explosives into the building and you know, that's what does all the killing on the battleground. The artillery, mortars, tanks, rockets. Mm. Your rifle, if that accounts for 1% of the dead in this war, mm. I'd be surprised. Mm. I'd be surprised, you know. It's, it's more rockets, mortars, etc. So you've made a group of friends uh, and you've been put into a unit of roughly 30 men. Something like that, yeah. yeah. Um, um, did you have any say into, into which group of 30 you were put or it was just random? Um, there was some, yeah, there was, I was always happy, you know, the, the guy I, my first platoon commander or section commander, mm. you know, 
um, whatever you want to call it, because obviously with numbers going up and down, he was both, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, he was an uh, ex-US Marine uh, guy with several tours and uh, a guy who as a civilian had like run his own companies and stuff. So he's basically intelligent and competent and professional and a nice bloke. Mm -hmm. So I was like, wicked. I've got good NCO leadership from, from kind of day one. Right. And uh, then um, like, uh, but other people... Mm -hmm. uh, did move around a bit, you know, we had a, a few guys join, like, my my co Italian coffee pot and my ghillie stove mm -hmm. and my mess tins and my ability to make hot drinks that, like, no one had thought to bring a gas cooker and stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. They all thought the Ukrainians were just going to, you know, provide everything and nope. So uh, my, my coffee making, my hot drink little cafe that was running while we are out in the freezing woods after the missile attack, mm -hmm. that drew quite a lot of people in. Right. And they're like, hi, um, yeah, you seem to have a really nice uh, platoon here. Um, is there any way we could, you know, join? We're not that happy over there. These guys aren't being that friendly to us. And it's like, yeah, OK. And then, you know, one or two, it was like, oh, you know, yeah, you're going to have to ask the boss. And then the guys who turned up was like, hi, yeah, we brought you this jar of hot chocolate and this sugar. And we want some guys got some UHT milk. And it's like, oh, right. Would you, do you want guys want to join? Because, mm -hmm. you, you know, you turned up with something in your hand. That's the right attitude straight right. away. So we did have some guys. Guys did move around units. I mean, as volunteers, we had quite a bit of freedom to do things like that okay. that you wouldn't normally get in the military. Right, but you're also trying to size people up. Yes. And uh, you, you're, you're looking not just at the people who are going to lead you, are they going to be competent, but also these, these people, are they going to just try to rob me? Are they going to run away? Yeah. Are yeah. they actually who they claim to be? Yes, well? yes, we did. I mean, all of these are factors. Uh, we had, I remember one guy, I asked everyone to go and get me uh, uh, twigs for the, uh, for the ghillie stove, you know. Like, go and find some kindling. You all know what kindling is, don't you? Deadwood. Nice and thin, okay? Mm -hmm. And some of the people are city boys. I don't really blame them. But this one guy had said he was Swedish, uh, or like Arctic Rangers, which is like super duper long range, sneaky peaky recce. Mm -hmm. And he brought me over green wood from a pine tree. <clears throat> and it's like... Look up. If you want to find kindling, look up. That's yeah. where the dry stuff is. Yeah, Not that, on the forest floor where it's all wet. At the, at the, quite right. And at that point, I knew that this guy... Was a liar. Was a liar, you yeah. know? Like, it, yeah, Swedish, you don't know... Yeah, green kindling. You don't... You brought me green kindling and you say that you were some outdoors nature recce guy, you know? Mm. No. No, 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 no. This is Boy Scout level stuff. But the modern, the modern army doesn't teach all the kind of oldie-timey survival Boy Scout camping stuff that they don't, they don't do. They just kind of found it a bit redundant, you know, like, they don't even, right. you know, the, you know the modern, I don't know if the British Army stopped, the Canadian Army, uh, for instance, mm -hmm. stopped issuing mess tins quite a while ago. Everything's a self-heating boil in the bag now. Why right. would you need mess tins, you know? Mm. Um, I personally think they're absolutely essential, and again, that proved to be true. Um, but yeah, uh, so that a lot of the guys don't have these skills that me just starting, you know, starting life with the Boy Scouts and stuff have learned from an early age. Mm. So that was something useful I could do for the unit, but it was also a bit like, oh God, you know, I'm having to teach guys how to, some guys are like, had literally never taken a squat before, you know? Right. Some guys were like, oh, feeling really rough. When are you going to have a shower? And it's like, mate, we might not have a shower for weeks here's a pack of wet wipes, and they'd look at you like, really? And it's like, yeah, that's... Be grateful we have wet wipes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, that's a wonderful technology. I'm sure World War II soldiers yeah. would, have, would have found them fabulous. The wet wipes. The Crusades, we would have definitely... Oh. If they'd had wet wipes, we would have won the Crusades because you wouldn't have one man die of any sort of chafing-related illnesses, mm. you know, that you get along. And the marching would be a lot quicker, a lot less grumbly. Yeah, wet wipe. If right. I could go back in history and give Richard the Lionheart wet wipes, yeah. England would rule the world. Yeah, because if you'd given him, say, a machine gun, he, uh, he wouldn't have been able to repair it or manufacture ammunition for it. Really not that useful, but wet wipes. Yeah, they could have cobbled together something like that in those yeah. days, you know. Yeah, and, yeah like healthy, a healthy army wins wars. Mm. Um, so, yeah, uh, there were a lot of guys who were just no basic, no basic survival skills, and they, some of them were pretty well-trained military people. But, you know, there have been 20 years of Afghanistan. No one's had to 
make a fire over there. You just go back to Camp Bastion every day and eat from a nice canteen or a McDonald's or a KFC in, the, mm. in a big truck in the desert, you know. There's no, there's no worm stew anymore or need to uh, need to know how to like gut a pig or a deer or a right. rabbit or anything like that. Or eat stuff that would make a billy goat puke. Yes, basically. Mm. So, yeah. Um, well, we're getting a bit muddled up. Right, anyway, so now you're in the new camp and you, you've, you've possibly moved these tents that were yeah, all we've together. Yeah, we've moved, we've moved the tents, uh, spread them out. I mean, that, that took a few days of, like, we had, we had a very obtuse Ukrainian commander at that point. The, the first commander we had was this little chap. He mm -hmm. was very fast. Mm -hmm. He walked around. And he was called... Um, I, I mean, you know what? I'm not going to say their names. Oh, fair but, enough. But it sounds a bit like Bog Pan. Okay. And it's a Ukrainian name, so I'm sure with the intelligent listeners you have, they'll be able to work it out. And we, right. had, we had three of them all together. Bog mm -hmm. Pan the first, who we were called Bog Pan the Quick. Right. Bog Pan the second, mm -hmm. who were called Bog Pan the, Bog Pan the Inept. Ah. And Bog Pan the third, who we were called Bog Pan the Quiet, for he never says a thing. Oh, right. you know? And they were the three commanders we had over the seven months mm -hmm. of the war so far and me being in the Legion. Um, Bog Pan the Quick, who I thought was ex an excellent officer, right. uh, he just sort of got pushed out by Bog Pan the Inept quite early on. Mm -hmm. uh, some kind of Ukrainian officer politics going on there. But suddenly he had to leave and he didn't want to leave us. And I hope he's OK. I gave him a... a a uh, webbing pouch for a, for a pistol magazine when he left. I was, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I thought he was a fine officer. And then we were lumbered with Bog, Bogdan the Inept, who was, you know, having, like, who am I to criticise a senior officer running an army camp? You're, well, I'm you're a, a witness to his behaviour. So I'm, a Brit I'm, a British, I'm a British guy who mm -hmm. has worked organising and helping to run festivals. Now, a festival is almost exactly the same as an army camp. Only an army camp doesn't have the entertainment, you know. Right. There are people coming in, there are people going out. They all have to have some form of ID and wristband. We need to have people on gates with radios controlling mm -hmm. all of this. Food is served several times a day. This needs to be organised too. Mm -hmm. There are activities, etc. So it's very, very similar. And a bunch of stuff you know, from the early days. It's like, why are we waiting on a captain and a major to come to the range to tell a bunch of recruits that they can start zeroing their rifles. And why are the recruits out there on the range in the bloody cold and the wet for two or three hours waiting for these senior officers to come to the range? Mm. You know, uh, why did it take us nine days, two weeks to issue weapons when we actually saw where the weapons were on the base? It's like, well, you could have just sent us over there squad by squad. Mm -hmm. And they got a couple of sergeants in there. Yeah, yeah, that one's nice and unrusty. Here you go. Here's a cleaning kit, sign your name, on your way. Next shots. I could have issued all our guys' weapons in like a morning. Mm -hmm. Somehow it took a week and a half. Somehow, you know? So there's just, oh, were Soviet doctrine or a hangover of Soviet doctrine um, starts mm -hmm. and were, you know, incompetent starts mm. and were maybe willfully sabotaging the military effort of your nation starts is hard to say. Why would they do the third of those? Well, if, let's say, you were a Ukrainian, but you're actually a bastard and a Russian traitor, you know, a traitor for the Russians, and there's there, those people are out there, they exist, perhaps if you got yourself into a senior position in the army, they're in charge of training recruits or moving a, an infantry uh, company or battalion around mm. maybe you could claim if the russians win if you're just really bad at your job you can sort of claim that you're on the russian side the whole time you know um, it's a way of hedging your bets possibly i mean it's not possible to say but all i will say is this commander turned out to be so dissatisfactory mm. that the entire of bravo company and the entire of Charlie Company flat refused to have him anymore. And there was essentially a rebellion and, and a petition and enough fuss made. You know, he fired uh, platoon commanders and stuff who just like were, were Finnish officers. Mm -hmm. So instead of just, just taking it lying down, they went to Kiev and spoke to people about it. Mm. You know, and we're like, I'm not, I'm not taking it. That was completely wrong. 
to sack that officer, uh, well, the NCO, who mm -hmm. happened to be an ex-Finnish officer. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we managed, we managed to get rid of him, but it took a couple of months, you know? And um, there was all kinds of stuff. Like, there was a, we had, under his command, and with the help, obviously, of other people who is... He had, like, sergeants, and, you know, he had his son with him. He had his son with him, mm -hmm. and he had a sergeant who was his godson. So, like, the nepotism is strong with this one, mm. you know? And uh, under when they when Bravo Company moved from the, the base near Rivna City to, to Kharkiv, mm. uh, we had a truck, two trucks, with 84 M4s, which is a rifle, for yeah. those who don't know, mm. 12 SCAR heavies, which were for the, our designated marksmen, which is another fan, very fancy military rifle, mm -hmm. and a couple of javelins, and an absolute truck oh and some 240 a couple of machine guns mt40 mm -hmm. bravos and an absolute truck full of ammo right just went missing in the convoy these vehicles just disappeared as this convoy was in transit now if this was just some random purr of happy-go-lucky opportunistic gypsy thieves perhaps mm -hmm. who who just saw these two trucks and popped into it well in Ukraine, there's a, there's a roadblock block sodding everywhere. Like, every five kilometres maximum, mm -hmm. there's another roadblock with some troops in it. Any one of these, they can stop you and check your ID. And if you're driving a truck full of military stuff, they're almost certain to. Mm -hmm. So how these two random mystery thieves got away with two trucks full of weapons and ammo and just disappeared into the ether, mm -hmm. I don't know. But they were very lucky if that's how it actually happened, which is the official explanation of how a whole company's worth of Western weapons uh, went missing. So that's the sort of thing that was happening under him. There was also, while I was away getting medical leave, because mm. uh, after I was in Ukraine for a month and I got Lyme's disease and, you know. Well, well yes, so um, you were in a, in a trench one night and you uh, oh, yeah. woke while, up with while, something in your nose? While we were at Rivna, uh, we'd, we'd, that, that base had been attacked as well. We had a, a drone, apparently a drone strike mm -hmm. uh, on on the base. And it, it, it not our section, but there was another tent city that they hadn't spread out. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Again, poor Ukrainians not having as much clout to demand what they think uh, is fair with, with, the, with their officers, you know, because we had quite a bit of clout being honoured fallen volunteers and they didn't mm -hmm. so they didn't get to space the tents out and then the russians fired a thermobaric uh, weapon at the tents and killed about 135 of them or something it was really quite bad mm. all young all young officer recruits as well apparently so yeah that was that was pretty bad and this base had been hit so now you know we're spending an awful lot the bloody air raid alarm goes off and we're sort of right right you know run a couple of you know 100 meters or so get into one of the trenches that are around the because unfortunately there was a lot of pre-dug trenches and foxholes around where they'd put us which was nice mm -hmm. and um yeah uh start uh you know just just getting there and i woke up with uh, a couple of ticks but one particularly massive fat one that was like the size of my whole little fingertip was just blocking my nose and i woke up to this like oh uh, what 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 is that what are, uh, blah, uh, oh god look at that horrible bastard you know mm. and like and that was then a few like a week or so later 10 days later like every joint i had ached and everyone was they weren't feeding us very well at the time pretty much everyone had covid or some kind of common or garden flu you know mm -hmm. you take a couple of hundred guys from every country in the world stick them together in a dirty field that they're, they're gonna get sick you know right. in the cold with not enough food and then i got there's ticks on top of it and then a week later I was just like so so ill mm -hmm. so very ill and um, I went to the hospital in Rivna and the, the doctor was not to western standard um, looked like he smoked about 80 a day and had a bottle of vodka every night and he just sort of using some very 1950s implements you know nothing modern plastic and disposable just all like steel and dip it in a dinner probably in a glass of vodka afterwards right. and he just cleaned my nose out with a bit of hydrogen peroxide and went, you are fine and i'm like no, i'm not i'm not fine so i came back to the uk and i got uh, a couple of weeks uh, medical supplies mm. uh, a couple a couple of what i'm saying i got um 
some intravenous antibiotics and then some pills. Um, and the confirmation it was Lyme's yeah, disease. Yeah, and a confirmation it was Lyme's disease. Yeah. And then I, yeah, uh, the course was 12 weeks, but I uh, only stayed in the UK for four. And then I came back uh, to Ukraine um, and had to go through Yaraviv. The base had been blown up that was still like the induction centre. And then uh, it's a very big base, so they sort of right. move things around a bit. Uh, you know, 20, 20 by 40 kilometres kind of base, you know. Mm. Um, and uh, had to go back to Yaraviv, and then they sent me to Rivna again. And this time I was with Charlie Company. Mm -hmm. Bravo had deployed a day or two before I got back to Rivna, which was a bit annoying because I wasn't with my mates. But mm -hmm. there were still some people uh, who from the original lot who were helping train up Charlie and helping organize things mm -hmm. and um, there was a, a Canadian colonel um, who I'll call Heisenberg um, okay. it's fairly easy to work out what his actual name is from that I think uh, I've guessed already but uh, he he was a, a I was we were honored to have him to have such a senior and experienced officer helping train us you know to NATO standards and uh, I ended up uh, becoming the I was with Charlie three for a bit and just plodding along with them but then when we actually deployed I was uh, I got asked to be in the uh, company CP mm -hmm. so I was the colonel's That's assistant, command post right? a command post yeah, yeah so I became the colonel uh, colonel's assistant mm -hmm. which basically made me a sergeant for a bit and it was all, you know, I was very enthusiastic about it. I mean, obviously I wanted to go because I wanted to fight, but my, my thing also was just to be, I wanted to serve Ukraine. And if making the brain and the, the speaking mouth of our command work a lot better mm -hmm. is the best way I can help, then I was happy to. And, you know, you're working with a very senior officer who respects you, so that's an honour in its own way. Mm -hmm. And um, and then, well, the, uh, the commander of... Charlie, the Ukrainian commander of Charlie, seemed to, when we actually got deployed, seemed to think that uh, picking a nice house for him and all his drivers to stay in mm -hmm. uh, was much more important than picking a house where you had radio uh, comms to your actually deployed, you know, your units in the field. Right. And um, they, that was, yeah, after a few weeks of basically being in a CP where I did nothing but sit around and smoke cigarettes and barbecue food for the Ukrainian officers mm -hmm. once a day, I, uh, I had enough of that and I transferred back to Bravo. Oh, right. Uh, which caused a bit of a, you know, we didn't, the, could Charlie off, the Charlie company officer didn't like it, but, you know, I got my way. Mm -hmm. And then I was back in Bravo Company with my mates, basically. Right, and they had been deployed. Yeah, they'd been deployed. They'd been uh, they because I I basically spent uh, April and May uh, either back in the UK getting medical treatment or back in the in in, in the base near Rivna, um, just to go basically going through a repetition of what I'd gone through already, just more basic military training, which was good, you know, and I was happy to just be there, but yes. they'd been in a village uh, that was uh, by a, a large river that's east of Kharkiv, and that's about as, as much detail as I can actually give for where we were deployed, but they mm -hmm. were forming um, a light infantry screening and observation action along this bit of the front to make sure that the Russians didn't cross uh, or didn't try and push any of the dams and bridges and causeways and stuff that came along, that came across this area of water and swamp. Okay. And um, that's what that's what they'd been doing, and they continued to do that as as I rejoined them, just in a different section of that line. Right, and we'll find out about that in another video. Okay. Thank you very much. Cool. If you want a deeper understanding of what we've been talking about, then you could do an awful lot worse than visit the website of, yes, I'm aware that this is going to sound very contrived, but here it comes anyway, my sponsor. My sponsor is Audible, which is a gigantic repository of audio files of all sorts, audio books and podcasts and interviews and comedy shows. If it's in an audio format uh, and principally it's the spoken word, it's not a music specialist, uh, then Audible is the place to go. Um, and uh, I typed in Ukraine and got instantly a lot of very pertinent hits. For, for instance, you might want to understand 
how did we get to here? So a history of the Ukraine would be very useful, and they have one of those in The Gates of Europe, a history of the Ukraine. Uh, and that came out originally in 2015, which is after the start of the current crisis, but of course before the invasion. But it has been updated since uh, in the light of uh, the rapid escalation uh, in that area, and that's an illustration of how an audiobook can be a bit more nimble than the printed word, because all you have to do to update an audiobook is record more stuff and then upload a file to the internet, put it on a site like Audible, and it becomes instantly available. Um, and so audiobooks can be quite a bit more nimble than the, the printed word. Um, and there are two audiobooks that have come out just in the last few days, so they are one would imagine, bang up to date. Uh, one of these is Putin's Wars, um, and the other one is Overreach. That one's the top hit, and that one claims to get inside Putin's head and analyse just what was he thinking, this man who has normally been fairly shrewd and cautious, um, but it seems that he cooked up this bizarre gamble during the, uh, the pandemic and somehow thought that he was going to get away with it. Um, and if you want to be even more up with the latest, why not listen to Ukraine The Latest, which is a podcast. And of course, podcasts can be uh, very, very up to date. And uh, there are 193 episodes of that. And if that's not enough, there are 102 episodes of the Russia-Ukraine War Report. Although it shouldn't really be calling itself War Report, because technically this isn't really a war. Um, but anyway, um, and uh, in order to uh, avail yourself of all this, you could go to uh, audible.com stroke Lindy Beige, because if you go that way, you will find uh, details of a free try period, free trial period, uh, during which you get one completely free and yours to keep forever audiobook, uh, and you can browse the site and listen to as many of the Audible Plus catalogue as you like. And that's quite an extensive catalogue now. Um, you could also uh, text Lindy Beige to 500 500 or even better, click the link in the description. Now, I am contractually obliged to show you uh, pictures of me listening to something on Audible using a device. So let's do that now. <coughs> okay, well, I, I hope you found that uh, instructive and, and perhaps enticing. So why not visit Audible? If you'd like to help me and Mine Action Group uh, in our endeavour to uh, remove landmines from the world and make, make the place safer, or if you'd like to help uh, the guys who are right now, my friends who are right now fighting the Russians in increasingly worse weather conditions with winter looming, there are links in the description to both of those organisations. Uh, the money going to the Legion will go directly to someone I know at the front uh, so it, it won't go missing with any bureaucracy on the way. Anyway, thank you very much, and please give generously, you will actually be saving lives.